This video is part of the Commercial Building Electrical Design Series. Uh, it's also part of the introduction. In this video, we want to talk about codes and standards. What's the difference between a code and a standard, and how does this guide uh, our work when we're doing electrical design? Well, a code is something that is legally required, so we, we have to adhere to it. So any code that is not followed uh, in the process of doing our design uh, will likely cause it to not make it through permitting when it goes to the plan review office. But more importantly, this could result in an incident that could lead to legal action that could be taken towards the company uh, or the designer of record. A standard, on the other hand, is not usually legally required, but it's a guideline for our design that will help to ensure that our design interfaces uh, with other equipment or designs, or it meets some minimum requirement or expectation uh, by either the owner or some other uh, industry entity. So let's talk about codes, uh, especially as they affect electrical design. <clears throat> Probably the, uh, the primary source for most of the electrical codes comes from the National Fire Protection Agency. And you'll see this abbreviated as NFPA. So some of the more common uh, NFPA documents that uh, we utilize in electrical design <coughs> are uh, first is NFPA 70. So this is probably the primary uh, document we use here and this is referred to as the National Electrical Code. And so in this it <coughs> talks a lot about uh, working with wire and conduit and different installation types. <coughs> and so there's quite a bit of information in, in this document. Next we have NFPA 72. Uh, this is more commonly known as the fire alarm code. So anything to do with fire alarms and their installation uh, is usually governed by this document. Uh, if you do any work with healthcare, um, <clears throat> NFPA 99, this is considered the healthcare code. And this embraces more than just electrical, uh, it does embrace all trades, much like uh, NFPA 101, it's the life safety code. So this has to do with anything involved with getting people safely out of a building. Uh, so uh, for electrical, it would have to do with um, egress lighting and some fire alarm uh, constraints on that as well, especially in, 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 in view of the uh, egress paths. Um, if you work in uh, locations that have flammable materials, such as flammable liquids or dust, then you uh, might utilize NFPA 497 and 499. And then finally, uh, if your building is going to have a lightning protection system, uh, then we would utilize NFPA 780. This is the lightning protection code. <clears throat> now, keep in mind, there are way more NFPA documents than this, and you would utilize you know, various ones for different types of projects or special conditions. And then uh, they also uh, affect more than just the electrical trade. So that's what some of the documents are. So there are many, many NFPA documents, but these are some of the more commonly used uh, when doing electrical design. So there are other codes uh, that can affect the electrical design that are not NFPA documents. Uh, and these would include uh, some of the following. Uh, one's the International Building Code. And so again, this is a multidiscipline code that's used to govern uh, building design. There is a section in there for electrical However, most of it is just NFPA 70 or the National Electrical Code recopied in there. So as far as electrical goes, it's not a whole lot of difference there. <clears throat> you can have local codes and you know this would be uh, codes that have been adopted by states or counties or even cities. One example I know of this is, you know, I've done work in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. It's been years, but uh, years ago I did. And Memphis actually had its own separate electrical code. Um, so it was apart from the National Electrical Code. And while there were similarities, there were obvious, there were some obvious differences as well. I don't know if Memphis still has that, uh, but I know at one time it did, and I know other cities can have the same thing. So when you go into a, an area that you haven't worked before, you kind of need to do a code study to find out what codes have been adopted there and what governs that. Luckily for electrical, it's almost always a National Electrical Code, but there could be instances where that's not the case. Uh, you can also be 
governed by energy codes. And so for our case, that usually comes from ASHRAE, which ASHRAE are documents that are put out by the Mechanical Engineering Society. Um, so Article 90.1, it has the standard tables that we use uh, for energy codes. And, and many local jurisdictions have adopted this as part of their enforceable code. So that being the case, it is legally required from us to do that many times. And so this can govern how many light fixtures uh, we can have in an area and how much energy is expended in those areas. Another one is Americans with Disabilities Act. This can govern our work as well. So if we have a building that falls under the ADA uh, requirements, this can affect us. Probably the, the primary way I think of there is if there are any wall sconces, which are fixtures that are mounted to the wall. Uh, they can't protrude out more than four inches. Uh, if they're more than four inches, then that's not ADA compliant. Uh, there's the building officials and code administrators. Some local authorities adopt uh, aspects of this document or these documents. Um, one example in particular, I think, as far as electrical goes, is this is uh, they have a requirement that pull stations for fire alarms have to be within five feet of all the egress doors. Um, but uh, you know they can they could pull other aspects of that as well. So now we want to look at standards and uh, you know how these affect electrical design. And so there are some different types of standards uh, that we need to be aware of. So let's take a look at those now in some examples. Uh, the first is industry standards. And so some examples of that would be like uh, Bixi uh, standards. And so Bixi is an organization that uh, has to do with telecommunication design and distribution. So they produce uh, these telecommunication distribution distribution method manuals. You'll see them referred to as TDMM. And so these are the documents that are used for the basis of uh, a certification that they offer, which is called RCDD, which is Registered Communication Distribution Designer. And so uh, that's actually becoming more and more prevalent because most government agencies now require an RCDD to review and seal uh, the telecommunication drawings. And this is in addition to an electrical engineer seal. So uh, you'll, you'll see those referenced many times. Uh, there's also ANSI TIA standards. And again, these have to do with telecommunication. So we don't have a lot of code requirements on the telecom side. We, it's really more standard driven. Uh, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because you want your, your telecommunication system to be able to interface with other telecom systems and with the internet and outside uh, utilities. And so we have to design to these standards uh, to make sure we are compliant with that. Uh, you also have IEEE standards. And so this can govern both the, the power lighting side and the telecom side. And so there's, there's several different IEEE standards that, uh, that we usually design to or that, that drive a lot of what we do. And they also drive some of the codes, to be honest, uh, in some cases. And then we have stuff like... Uh, UL508A Underwriter Laboratory, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but you know, if we do have an instance where we have to design a control panel uh, to go in our facility, which isn't very often in commercial buildings, it's more an industrial side um, or utility side, uh, but if, if that does happen, then, then the control panels need to be designed and constructed to the UL508A standard. So uh, in addition to industry standards, we can also have manufacturing standards. And so these provide more of a, a basis of design as far as a minimum level of quality. Um, and usually they're, they're asked for. And so you can have NEMA standards. And so this stands for the National Electrical Manufacturers Association Standards. So it's an organization that they, they maintain and uh, these standards for electrical construction. You can have ISO standards, and so this usually has to do with a, a uh, entity or facility, uh, and so they'll have these, these ISO standards, and that's, again, to, to ensure a certain level of quality of the work that's done. Uh, another type is you can just have owner standards, and so uh, these can be things that are imposed on us by our owner or our client. And so probably one of the most common that I know of is the Unified Facility Criteria uh, standard, which is UFC. 
and you're going to see this if you do any type of government work so they maintain these standards and uh, enforce them actually on their work so uh, the place that I work now we do a lot of work for DOD and military bases and so all of that work falls under the UFC standards and so you know we still have the National Electrical Code that governs our work but then these uh, kind of go hand in hand with that to extend um, you know our design work and to guide that uh, you can have franchise standards so I've done quite a bit of like hotel work so if I do a Holiday Inn uh, when I get the project they always send me their standards and so they have standards for all disciplines you know how the rooms are to be laid out what lighting they want in there how many lights where they want power outlets uh, these types of things so um, you know while I have to go to permit review with these plans I also have to go to franchise review and so our plans will be sent off to the franchise representatives they'll review them they'll mark them up say hey this doesn't meet our standard and so you know if we if we want to finish the job and get paid we have to design it to the standards and to the code as far as that goes and this can go for for other things like a chick-fil-a or a mcdonald's or anything like that you know if it's a franchise they'll almost always have some franchise standard that they want you uh, to to meet or design to you can also have campus standards and so uh, two places i've run into these are on a college campus uh, like it suggests so like if you know i do work for uh or someplace like Olivet or University of Illinois, Mississippi State University, anywhere like that, they almost always have some type of campus design standard, and that's so they can maintain some level of quality and they end appearance between all their buildings, and then you know, a lot of times the buildings interact with each other in some way, and so, you know, we'll have the campus standards. I've also run into this uh, at uh, hospitals, so if you go to a, a hospital a campus where they have multiple buildings like bed towers and and critical care units and medical office buildings they'll have them all kind of on the same campus and so many times they'll have a design standard of how they want everything to be done uh, as far as that goes so in addition to that uh, we can have internal or company standards and so this is something that we kind of impose on ourselves and almost always you'll have at least some type of CAD standard and so you know you want your drawings to be uniform across uh, disciplines you know, and that has to do with text size and um, font style and all those types of things. And so that, that is important and something that, you know, like I said, we enforce on ourselves. And then more importantly, we can have design standards within our discipline. And many places I've worked, we have that. This can be things like, you know, we only use copper bus. We won't use aluminum bus or, or, or even manufacturers or some, certain, some manufacturers we prefer over others. Or some that we may not use. One company I worked at, they absolutely forbid us to design anything to simplex fire alarm standards. We could use other fire alarm systems, but not simplex. I mean, they had some bad experience with them, and so they kind of wrote that into our own internal standards uh, not to design around them. <clears throat> so in addition to that, there are some other terms that are related to codes and standards that I thought it'd be good for us just to touch on real quick uh, moving forward. And so Let's look at those. First is authority having jurisdiction. So even though we have codes that guide our work, um, ultimately our work will be reviewed and, and uh, accepted by the authority having jurisdiction. And so they are the, the supreme authority then, and it has to do with what geographical jurisdiction you're in. So if it's in a certain city or state or whatever, whoever the plan review office is and whoever issues the permit, they will be the authority having jurisdiction and so they are the ultimate interpretation of the code so you may interpret a certain type of code one way all over the country but then you go into this this jurisdiction and that that AHJ is what you'll see that is abbreviated as AHJ uh, they'll come back and say nope that's not the way we interpret it we want it this way and you know the bottom line is what they say goes and so if that's the way they interpret it then that's the way we have to do it and I mean you, you usually can have conversations with these these guys as long as you're respectful and you know you can present your case and many times they will you know listen to you and, and, and maybe try to do it the way you want it but uh, you know to be careful of that so what what are some typical examples of AHJ like I said you could have a plan reviewer so this is who you submit your plans to uh, to apply for a permit 
after those plans are reviewed and it goes into construction, you'll many times have a local inspector that comes out at, at uh, strategic times throughout construction, and he'll he will inspect things to make sure they're okay. You can have instances where a plan reviewer sees it one way and the local inspector sees it a different way. This happened to me several times when I worked in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, that can be problematic. And you a lot of times have to get together and we agree on, on what's the best way forward. Uh, another AHJ is fire marshal. Uh, they usually can come in and trump everybody. You know, if they don't like the way the fire alarm system's installed, or if you've got smoke evac system that has to be installed, or some life safety issue, you know, they can they can trump everybody. Um, you know, you can have other government agencies as well. So you might have some inspection required by the ADA uh, from the FCC. Uh, you can from the FAA. If you're near an airport or working on something in the airport, there's healthcare regulatory agencies. If you're doing hospital work, each state has their own separate regulatory agency and their own standards, and the list goes on. You know, so you kind of have to do a little bit of homework as you start a design in a new area or in a new new uh, area that you haven't geographical or you know type. You know, if you've done schools your whole life, now you're going to do a church or a hospital. You know, you need to take a step back and say, hey, okay, what are the the regulatory agencies in this field that I need to be aware of. So another term we want to talk about is UL listed. <clears throat> you know, we talked about a UL standard earlier, but um, you know, you need to be aware of that term. You're going to hear is this UL listed, and what that stands for is Underwriter Laboratories listing. And so this is a third-party entity um, that they'll take the product and they test these products. To, uh, to nationally recognize safety and sustainability standards for whatever the product category is. And so, you know, anytime a manufacturer comes up with a new product, they'll submit it to UL and, and apply for what listings they want. And, you know, UL test it and either they'll get the listing or they will not. Uh, UL listing is important, uh, probably for the most reasons, because insurance companies may deny a claim if they find out that products used for certain applications were not UL listed for that application. So you got to be careful uh, with that. Uh, part of the process in all disciplines is submittal review, and this is one thing we always try to check when we do submittal reviews to make sure that it, it is UL listed for whatever application it is. And just as an example of some of the different types of applications we can see, you know, at least in electrical, it could be is it UL listed for a dry location, for a damp location, for a wet location. Uh, you know, there's many other categories that you can you can get UL listings for, but um, you know, UL listed UL listing is for lamp life. You know, if they advertise a certain lamp life, that has to be UL listed for that. Interesting thing about that I learned is the way they get a lamp life rating, UL takes 100 light bulbs or whatever bulb they're trying to get listed and they line them up in a row and you know they energize them and let them run forever and you know eventually you know bulbs will start to burn out and when the 50th bulb burns out that's when they stop the test and say that's the life of the bulb, the UL listed life of the bulb. So kind of an interesting uh, side, side story there. Finally, the last term I wanted to just touch on real quick is value engineering, and we may talk about this a little more later, but, um, you know, it's a very important concept, especially thinking about these codes and standards, and so the reason for that is many times in order to help a project be within budget, uh, oftentimes value engineering exercises will be conducted to explore alternate materials and methods for accomplishing the same design. And so in these cases, it's important that the designer both the electrical and yourself, if you're, you know, the project manager, that you be familiar with these different materials and methods and their trade-offs. And so, uh, kind of some of the more common ones that are used in electrical design would be like, uh, you know, like I said before, we always specify copper conductors uh, in our panels and gear and wire. Well, one of the first things they'll always do is try to allow for aluminum. You know, aluminum's cheaper. But aluminum has some problems or issues or trade-offs, like I said, and we'll talk about those later in the course. Uh, but they can definitely save some money. So, you know, you need to be aware of what these trade-offs are, communicate them to the client, you know, sit down and make some educated uh, decisions on what you can and cannot live with as far as value engineering. So these are, you know, just some of the introductory concepts that you may hear as we start, uh, start our discussions about electrical design. 
and I just want you to be aware of them and understand what they mean.